Good evening, everyone. Excellent. I want to welcome everyone, even those of you up in the balcony. Hi, balcony. Um, welcome you to the URI Honors Colloquium. Are you ready for the future? Tonight, we're moving into the third part of our series. We started with the, the big overview, 30,000 feet. We moved into the technologies, and tonight we begin with societal consequences. So, um, those could apply to you. Uh, I'm Judith Swift of Communication Studies and the director of the Coastal Institute. And my fellow coordinators are Peter Cornillan and Chris Roman. They're right down here in front. Um, both from the Graduate School of Oceanography, which is this year celebrating 50 years of excellence. I want to, yes, go for it, absolutely. For those of you who are here with us, um, Peter just got back from his cruise in the Mediterranean. That all sounds very elegant. Actually, it's a, it's a research uh, cruise. So. Um, he did, however, indulge in quite a bit of gelato. Um, I want to also thank our generous sponsors, in particular the G. Unger Vettelson Foundation, and also the co-sponsor of this evening's presentation, the Harrington School of Communication and Media, as well as the many sponsors that are listed on the screen behind me. If you're watching through our live cast, welcome. And since the focus of this evening is social media, I want you to feel free to watch the live cast while you're tweeting, posting on your Facebook wall, reminiscing about MySpace, and getting linked up. Now, for the important things. The exits are to the rear, the rear sides and the front sides. Restrooms are in the lobby and downstairs. Please turn off your cell phones. Try to refrain from frantic texting unless it's to submit a question. We'll explain that in a moment. Unwrap your candy and take your cough suppressants. Our speakers are going to entertain questions, so please send those questions, as it says on the screen right up here, to hcquestion at gmail.com. That's hc as in honors colloquium, question at gmail.com, or text to 401-284. 7444. That's 401-284-7444. I'm repeating that for the folks who are um, involved with the live cast. Or you can fill out a card that was passed out at the beginning of your entrance into the auditorium. These are going to be picked up at a couple of points through the talks. Now, one thing I'd like to ask you to do is if after you listen to our first speaker, you've got some questions, get those cards done so we can get them down here, get them picked up, get them entered in, and everybody gets a chance to get their questions attended to. That would be wonderful. The sooner you fill them out, the earlier you fill them out, the more likely you're going to get your question answered. We only edit the questions for the sake of brevity, or if more than one arrives with the same topic and they can be combined. I do want to remind you of our upcoming events. On November 15th, we have Lori Zoloth, who is addressing the issue of ethics and genetics. This is a change of date with Richard Clark, who will now be speaking on November 29th on cyber warfare. So the two are flipped. November 15th, Lori Zoloth, and November 29th, Richard Clark. Mr. Clark was asked to go to um, another country for something fairly urgent, and I think when someone is an expert in cyber warfare, we merrily send him on his way. So, to introduce this evening's guest, we have Winnie Brownell, who is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and herself a professor of communication studies. Winnie is an extremely strong supporter of the Honors Colloquium, and we're thrilled to have her here to introduce this evening's speakers. Winnie? Thank you, Judith. I want to congratulate Judith, Peter, and colleagues for producing such an incredible series. Uh, thanks for preparing us for the future, to, to face the challenges and the exciting opportunities 
that we look forward to. The Harrington School of Communication and Media sponsored two programs in this acclaimed series, and we were delighted to do so. The opening talk and tonight's program. We were able to do so thanks to the generous leadership gift from Richard Harrington to launch the Harrington School of Communication and Media. And Dick, I know you're watching us as we live cast, so thanks for transforming the University of Rhode Island. We've witnessed the powerful influences of mass media and social media and how they've transformed the ways we as individuals, as part of groups and part of societies communicate. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome two very talented experts who are going to explore some of the societal consequences of social and mass media that promise to challenge us and delight us in the future. Deb Broy received his Bachelor of Computer Engineering from the University of Waterloo in 1992 and his PhD in Cognitive Science from MIT in 1999, where he holds a tenured professorship, although he's currently on leave. One of his interests relates to the ways in which children learn language. He uses this information to create machines that are able to communicate in human-like ways. Roy video recorded some of his son's first three years of life to understand the basic processes of child language development. You may have viewed some of his intriguing work on the web before tonight. Using his home videos, Roy and his team have discovered surprising new insights into how one child learned to talk. Currently, he serves as CEO of Bluefin Labs. Roy and his co-founders at Bluefin Labs are investigating social media in the context of television shows and advertisements. They anticipate that their results are going to help marketers TV networks, and news organizations to better understand how audiences respond in real time to TV ads and programming. Widely cited, Roy is often featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the BBC, NPR, National Geographic, and at various exciting professional venues that address technology. His fellow expert, Joanna Blakely is the Managing Director and Director of Research at Norman Lear Center, a media-focused think tank at the University of Southern California, where she examines the impact of mass media and entertainment on our world. Blakely is responsible for all the digital research initiatives at the Lear Center, including the development of research databases, video archives, an online video remixing platform, enhanced Google Earth files, 3D modeling simulations, and a research center in Second Life. At USC, she led two major research initiatives addressing the impact of intellectual property rights on innovation and creativity. She's also conducted two nationwide polls on the relationship between political ideology and entertainment preferences. Blakely is currently co-director of a university-wide research initiative on creativity and collaboration in the academy at USC. Her research focuses on global entertainment, cultural diplomacy, celebrity culture, fashion, digital media, and intellectual property law. She's frequently cited in the New York Times Magazine, The Economist, Huffington Post, and Business Week, and she's appeared on Good Morning America and MSNBC. Help me welcome our talented experts who will explore tonight the rapidly changing, fascinating, and integrated worlds of mass media and social media, their influence, and the future. Thank you so much for that introduction. So when I think about the future, I think about the change that we are entering into, which I think is a sort of an era of change as profound as the Industrial Revolution, and it's just beginning. And the way that I look at it is more and more of our lives and our worlds are becoming interconnected through networks. And through all of those networks run software that runs at superhuman timescales with superhuman memory and 
what we're creating for ourselves is superhuman complexity, challenges that are starting to affect the way we think about government, the way we think about economics, the way we think about the military and beyond. So it's a very complex new world we're creating for ourselves. And the light at the end of this tunnel, or sort of the bright side of this, is that practically all software, when it executes, when software runs, it gives off a kind of data exhaust. All software, virtually, without exception, generates data. And as we are learning how to capture data and make sense of data, we are being ushered into what might be called the data revolution. And I think every aspect of human understanding and organization will be uh, changed as we enter into this, this new paradigm. What I'd like to do today is tell you about one effort that I'm involved in. Uh, it's actually a company that grew out of research that I led at MIT. And it's about a sea change that we are seeing and we hope to play a small role in, uh, in the world of media. So the, the phenomena that uh, we call social TV is pretty simple. You've got the worlds of television that goes back seven, eight decades, and the social web coming into full collision. And the interaction, or sort of what's at the root of it, is very simple. People are talking about what they're watching on TV while they're watching. So it seems simple enough. Here are examples of the sort of things on Twitter, on Facebook, on Google+, to limited ex extent on blogospheres, you'll find in growing quantities. Uh, someone saying, watching Pound General Hospital. So why would someone bother to broadcast that to their handful of friends that are listening to them? Well, this is a way to let others know what you're watching, and it actually influences and helps groups synchronize and tune in together and have a shared experience. Another example, a little bit of perhaps mindless commentary about something on late night, something with a little more substance, uh, reaction in real time to one of the GOP debates, and less frequently but consistently, conversations or comments about ads. Here's someone acting as a self-appointed ad repeater for a 30-second spot on TV. Here's someone providing a little bit of critical feedback to that same ad as it runs on TV. So with our technology, which I'll share a little bit more with you in a few minutes, we've been tracking the growth of social TV. So these are just some examples. In green are the growth in volume, the growth of the number of people talking about each of these three shows, these are reality TV shows, year over year. If you compare 2010 season premiere versus this year's premiere, we see triple digit growth in real reality TV. We see the same for comedies, especially if Ashton Kutcher is involved. We say, see this uh, in dramas. We're seeing this across the board, a kind of hockey stick growth in this uh, sort of habit, if you will, of people watching TV. So it's, it's in a fast growth mode. And the dynamic, we think, is pretty straightforward, which is you have television content, and that is driving conversations on the social web. And as comments and uh, uh, sort of feedback sort of litters uh, the, the various digital spaces, all of that is affecting people's decisions both of what to watch and also how they're interpreting what they're watching, because a lot of this conversation is seeping into the experience of television. So let me explain what Bluefin Labs, this company, does, which provides a, a somewhat unique lens into this new media world. What you're seeing here is a visualization of real data being pulled from uh, our uh, system. This is a picture of about 50,000 people. And the kind of cotton candy that you saw form a web over these people are all of the known public connections. When someone decides to publicly follow someone else or uh, connect with someone else, we will assemble a picture of that connected society of, of individuals that are active in social media. And then we'll create a second graph. We call this the content graph of television. Every node here is representing a TV show, 
an episode of a show or a commercial that airs on television, the two basic food groups of, of TV. And you'll notice that there's also a layer of links between all of the content on TV. And so right here, if, if you're in the television industry, television grew up as a linear medium. So the decisions that are made at a network such as CBS is what show follows what show, and then what ads should be inserted in, the, in each of these shows, and then you get this linear package and you broadcast it, and who knows who it reaches. That's basically the, the way that television grew up, because broadcast is sort of a one-way medium. What we're doing is operating satellite dishes and pulling in most of television as it's broadcast real-time across the country. And we've created machines that are actually watching TV, taking these linear feeds and unpacking them back into their original content and tracking every ad and every show as it runs across the entire television landscape. And our computers and analyses are also making all sorts of links. So anything that is classified as comedy gets connected. Every time that Gillette ad ran during that episode of CSI, they get linked. And so all of the various kinds of links between content and advertising we're keeping track of. And finally, so we have this graph of people and we've got this graph of television content. And in between is the critical kind of connective tissue where every line, and this is real data you're looking at, is showing an inferred connection that somebody in the social graph here made a comment about some particular piece of content on TV. And we know that because they said the right thing at the right time. They're watching the football game and they make a reference to Brady at just the right time. Our machines know that Brady just was involved in a play and the timing and the information of what someone says together lets us link. So we call this database the TV genome. It is, as far as we know, the most complete database ever created that links audiences to what they're watching. And in this database we have now 20 million people in the United States alone that are actively watching and talking about TV through social media. And every month we are indexing, sort of our machines are watching and then linking about 200,000 shows and about 2 million ads. So every month there's a huge volume of new data being added. And there's about 40 million of these links being added, sort of stitching together more and more densely our understanding of people and what they're watching. Okay, so that is the basis of, of the uh, um, some kind of explanations that we're starting to see or some insights we're starting to see into this world of social TV. So let's now dive into this data and I'll give you a, a bit of a tour of some of the things that this kind of uh, a uh, database can start to let us do. The first is a pretty simple view of the raw data. Along the bottom, kind of cut off a little bit, that says Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, so we've got time versus a few television networks that you might recognize. And one of the things we can do is lay this data out over time. And over time, Every one of these rectangles is a TV show. The wider the show, the longer it is, because remember, time runs this way. And so here we see on MTV, there were a couple of shows that ran roughly around prime time, and the height of each bar is measuring the number of people who commented on the show. So many of you have probably heard of Nielsen and Nielsen ratings. Nielsen measures how many people watch a show on TV across all of TV, or virtually all of TV. And what we're doing is measuring how many people talk about those shows. So sort of a complement, watching versus talking. Okay. We're doing this now for 215 of the biggest broadcast and cable networks. And we're doing it around the clock. Our you know, machines just keep running, keep watching, keep listening. And we're listening to what's approaching 10 billion comments, not million, but 10 billion comments a month. And processing all the words, all the phrases, all the hashtags, all the acronyms of all of that language in order to sift through and find the millions out of the billions that are about TV. Now, 
we can go beyond simply measuring how many people made a comment. And, and by the way, why would you want to do that? Well, if you have two different TV shows, why does Nielsen measure how many people are watching? The more people are there watching, the more valuable it is for an advertiser to reach that audience. And it's the advertiser dollars that pay for the production of all content on television. So that's how the whole system basically works. But now we have this new social signal that was until now silent, which is not just how many people are watching, but how many people remarked about a show. So you add up remarks and you get essentially a measure of remarkability. How remarkable is that programming? And we think remarkability or sort of engagement is a much deeper and sort of more telling indicator of, of what's actually happening in the medium. So let's zoom in on one of these shows. We know how many people commented on this show, but we can go deeper. We can drill in. It turns out that, that uh, we're going to look at one of the GOP debates, presidential debates, and pull up uh, the actual comments generated from about 100, 110,000 people in real time as they watch this debate unfold. So this is a kind of continuous and real-time feedback loop of what's happening across all of TV. We're seeing a tag cloud here. We can see which members, which candidates drove more conversations. We can see what topics drive conversation, and we can go through and see who's actually or what is actually being said. It's a kind of focus group in the wild. It's in the wild because we're not having to ask people to step out of their regular lives and, and fill in a survey or sit in a focus group. This is actually reactions in the flow. So it's a, it's a new kind of window into how people are reacting. We can look historic at historic data. This is a, a, a diagram showing four of the debates and one of the interesting things, this is the amount of conversation about each of the candidates. And we can see that this green line, which is kind of flatlining, suddenly starts to cruise up in terms of amount of conversation, and that is uh, Herman Cain. So real time, performance by performance, in this case in the debates, we can track the ascent, in this case, of one of the candidates. We can actually go even further and look at sort of the anatomy of a debate in terms of how people are talking about the debate and start finding what we call memorable moments. Romney and Perry uh, essentially get into a fight. Kane unveils the 999 plan. Uh, I think we have, yeah, well, you can sort of see all of the, some of the moments. What, what these are are candidate by candidate, the volume of conversation about that particular candidate. And when we find spikes, we automatically pull out those spikes and analyze what it was that provoked the particular reaction. The same idea of a remarkable moment can be applied not just to a de debate, but to a piece of sports programming. So here we have uh, an NFL game, and this is actually a product that the NFL launched last year and ran as a paid service for the season. This was powered by Bluefin. It's kind of difficult to see in this lighting, but there's actually a bar chart down here and these are the four quarters of a game. And each of these bars in what we call the social heat map is indicating how many people talked about each specific play. So our machines watch the game live, dissect the game into every play, every fumble, every pass, every touchdown, and then we listen to what people are saying. And we align plays to conversation. So why would you want to do this? Well, what could be the experience of football of the future well, there's no editors making decisions of what the highlights of this game are. You just look at where people are talking, touch that bar, and you go directly to that play. Or you just ask for a highlight reel of what people that love my team are talking about, and you automatically get a highlight reel, rather than having any editorial decision in, in the process. So this is kind of bringing the sort of world, or in this case, the national audience, into the TV experience. One more example of how we can start to do data-driven analyses and understand how social media and mass media are starting to come together. We have been looking at the data from the Egyptian revolution. And this is a very simple analysis, kind of an early stage. Uh, as we go, as again, cut off, this is sort of the 18 days uh, leading to the overthrow of Mubarak. And when we look at the first couple of days of that, sort of the 18-day uh, period, and we look at Facebook and Twitter, we have a tag cloud of what people are saying about Egypt. 
And you can get a, just a gist of what's happening as the protests start and there's violence erupting and there's a call for medics and for volunteers. And meanwhile, in that same period of time, if we take the archives of Al Jazeera, which Bluefin now is actually the, the longtime archival site for, and analyze what was said, how Egypt was covered in the mass media, in particular the voice of the Middle East effectively uh, for, for much of the world, we see a lot of talk of criminals and fighting and expression. And as we now move through our timeline here, we, we can watch sort of the, the social media, the word on the street versus the word in mass media start to shift away from criminals to political expression. And we see as we move further, we talk of violence and the, the mass media is now talking about democracy. And as we move to the end of our sketch of, of sort of this narrative of freedom, we see on the streets the congratulations uh, as the, uh, the transition of power occurs and the declaration of democracy uh, and sort of democratic process in the, the mass media. So these sort of dynamics we're able to start looking at uh, in, a, in a very precise and new way. So let me just, uh, for the last few minutes, shift and take a look at the business side of television. So why has TV not died? There were media pundits years ago who declared the imminent death of TV, and now you will recognize words like Google and TV and Apple and TV seem to go together just fine. The idea of TV is really synonymous with high quality or sort of premium video content, which is the best way to gather a large audience. And if you are any kind of an organization and you have the need to reach a lot of people, uh, nothing competes with television, tr as true today as it was 50 years ago. And so to assemble an audience, TV is the de facto, uh, sort of holds the, uh, the um, sort of winning title. But there's an old saying uh, that any marketer will, will know well and, and tell you is true, which is, you know, half of my advertising dollars if I'm a marketer are wasted. The problem is I don't know which half. And this has to do with this sort of broadcast mentality, which is television is a one-way medium. But I think what you hopefully you start to see glimmers of is the closing of this feedback loop, because the audience has always talked about what they're watching on TV. And finally, we're able to start at scale listening and linking that back. So a way to, to sort of look at this from an advertising perspective is a piece of TV content radiates through a television network and makes impressions on an audience that drives what's called impressions. Nielsen measures impressions. Ads are bought and sold based on how many impressions are being driven, how many eyeballs, how many people are watching. And, and yet, what's been true always about TV is people talk about what they watch. They comment on things they like, they comment on things they don't like, and so there's always been social expressions being generated as a result of impressions, but what's changed now is those expressions are being pushed out onto public forums. Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. People are creating their own networks and generating impressions on, on, on others without control of the television system. So there's a power shift to the audience. And what we're doing, and what I, I've been sort of talking you through, is using technology to bridge and understand the relationship between impressions and expressions. So just to give you a sense of how important marketers believe this is, here is a, a recent quote from the global chief marketing officer of Coca-Cola, the most valuable brand in the world. And here is the person who runs marketing for Coke saying, as he looks to the future of this, uh, at the, on the 125th anniversary of Coca-Cola, he's going to care more about, less about how many impressions their marketing activities generate, and he's going to look much more closely at the expressions of consumers as the real measure of success of the brand. So brands are listening, elected officials in office are listening, the news organizers are listening, the audience voice is being heard. And so just to kind of look at the same data now through the eyes of a marketer, uh, here is a, um, we're looking at criminal minds. These are the comments in response to this particular TV show. Uh, what we can do is go and analyze how amused, how vulgar, how calm or excited the audience on average was as they watched and talked about the show. And you can compare that to a show called Wipeout, or I could pick any of 
uh, thousands of shows, and we see vulgarity index high. Why would you care? Well, if I sell Pampers versus Old Spice, Old Spice, a kind of edgy young men's brand, Pampers, not so much, where would you rather have your brand live? Well, what's interesting is there has been an entire industry, a $70 billion annual U.S. industry, bigger than all of internet, radio, and print advertising combined. A massive industry based on human intuition that I think this show is probably better than this one. And now we have millions of people's voices letting us know where brands belong. This is a game changer for thinking about uh, where to advertise. Or, to give you another example of how we can slice the TV genome, this is what we call a genre wheel. So here are some genres you'll recognize. And what we can do is look up any show on TV. This is The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. And we can ask the question, we can interactively probe. This is a little uh, software interface we built. What shows on TV have overlapping engaged audiences with The Daily Show? And we see that there are shows like Meet the Press, or a spin-off of the, uh, the Colbert Report, which spun off of The Daily Show, where there's very high overlap between audiences. But we also find shows such as BBC's The Hour, which have high overlapped audience. Same people who watch and talk about The Daily Show watch and talk about The Hour on BBC. And we can do this for the entire television landscape. So if you are trying to promote The Daily Show, because that's your show, and you want to get more people to watch it, and talk about it, there's no better data source that we know of than the TV genome to generate this kind of list of where you'll find like-minded audiences. One last example, just to sort of drive home how this may change marketing. Rather than having a strict list of the shows that get the most talk on TV, if you did that, you'd find shows like Jersey Shore, some of you probably have heard of, will float to the top of the list, always, because it just gets more talk. But instead, if we generate a segment, find, say, a million people who we believe with high certainty are parents because they talk about their children, and we say, what shows on TV are those people talking most about? Jersey Shore disappears. And so do a lot of other highly talked about shows. And what you see is a lot of, as you might expect, children's programming. And we can go and resegment, and we can say, what about hardcore gamers, people playing video games? What are they watching and talking about on TV? You get a completely different list. How about people who love Diet Coke? What are they watching? Well, it turns out Coke doesn't know. But if you slice the TV genome, out pop the answers. Super size versus super skinny, why not? And we can go and look at the data behind it and, and verify that that actually is where you find Diet Coke drinkers. So if I'm Diet Pepsi, I might want to know where to run my next ad campaign based on this sort of data. So what we're doing, just to summarize, is this is the process by which television content gets uh, aired. There's a whole storytelling, creative development process. And then there is this linear programming, which leads to content airing on TV. And now there's something new. There is this at-scale audience voice. And what we're doing is creating, forging these feedback loops that let advertisers, let newsmakers, let marketers, let uh, content producers, studios, take the voice of the audience into account and enter into a sort of at-scale um, conversation. So just to summarize, back to the, our picture of the TV genome, what I think we're really starting to see in it is very much early days. When I talked about the data revolution, what I meant was it will be, I think, on the scale of the Industrial Revolution, which did not happen overnight. And I think this is a sea change, and we're just seeing the early days and getting a kind of glimpse of, of sort of these pictures. Here we go back to the TV uh, and the social landscape. And I'm going to show you three structures just to finish off. Here is a piece of TV content driving one person to comment. And as we trace that person's comments and look at all the people who hear that person's message, what we find is something very interesting. All of the people, or most of the people, who were, who were listening to that one person on Twitter also made a comment about that same piece of TV content as it aired. That's what all these lines coming back to the same telecast means. In other words, what we just discovered here is a group of friends, 
physically apart, but watching together. They're watching together because not only are they consuming the media together, but they're talking to each other as they watch. A very natural thing that we do in a shared space, but we don't have to be in a shared space anymore. We're seeing thousands of these virtual living rooms embedded in the TV genome. A second structure that we can now see is a very interesting kind of person. Here is someone that has, on one hand, a very high number of people who are following this person, connected to them, listening to what they're saying. And it turns out this person also has an unusually high propensity to talk about TV. They're just always talking about TV. So why would anyone have this kind of uh, a, a link structure? Well, this is essentially the equivalent of that person in USA Today that gets paid to watch TV and provide criticism, critique, the media critic, except no one's paying this person. This is just someone who has the same affinity, the same habit, and they have a few hundred people who like to hear what they think about a few dozen shows on TV. A very important person because, again, there are tens of thousands of these people that are influencing millions and sort of connecting these two landscapes. Finally, coming back to our theme of the elections as we enter into the election cycle, this is real data, and we're flying into one of the nodes in, that, in this particular sample. This is President Obama's State of the Union address from earlier this year. And at scale, in the same sample of 50,000, that piece of television content literally drove a nation into conversation. And in real time, in context, we can pick up the signal of a nation and read the kind of social circuits that are responding in different ways uh, to President Obama as he addresses the country. And so as I look to the future, I imagine how these kind of early insights, as they get incorporated into the way our governments, the way our companies, the way our organizations communicate with audiences, what we're really seeing is a one-way medium, the most powerful medium we've ever created, being turned from a one-way into a two-way communication cycle. And I think we are starting to see the first uh, sort of examples of conversations at scale. Thank you. Twitter handle, in case uh, anyone here is on Twitter, that's where you can find me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, while Johanna is getting ready to begin her, her section of the evening, I just want to say that we wanted to take a moment to remind you that you've just heard how important data is. So we're going to ask you to provide us with some data. When you email hcquestion at gmail.com, there is something that you can do for us, which is to put into the subject, not to ask a question. Don't do it to ask a question. If you want to ask a question, subject, question, OK? That, but to help us collect data on who is watching the live casts, if you folks can put in subject, lowercase, the word survey, and tell us who you are, where you are, why you're watching this particular um, presentation this evening, and help us to gather data so we understand what this colloquium is doing in terms of reaching people beyond those of you who are in this room. That's a very important thing because what it does for us is it helps us to know not only who we're serving, but it also helps us to know what kinds of investment this really is for the university in terms of giving back to the community as a whole. So it's very, very helpful if you can provide that. Again, that's at hcquestion at gmail.com, and in the subject line, put survey, lowercase. If you have a question, put question, lowercase. Okay, thank you, everybody, and I turn it over now to Johanna Blakely. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I want to thank uh, Peter and Chris and Judith for having me. I think the speaker series is just amazing. I can't think of anything this big at USC, at the University of Southern California, where I'm based. So it's really remarkable. And I just wish I could have been here for all the other speakers. That's the only thing I don't like about this series, is that they're not all here at once so I can meet them. So today, I'm going to talk about 
all of those social media platforms that you know and love or love to hate. The argument I'm going to make is that these social media platforms and the social networks that they host are actually going to have a transformative impact on traditional media, not just on the business model. I think everybody realizes that's going to happen, but also on the actual content that you're going to see on those media platforms. That means all of global popular culture, I think, is going to fundamentally change because of these new technologies. If you hadn't noticed, the media often provides a very distorted mirror of our lives. And I'd venture to say that when it comes to gender, to what it means to be male, what it means to be female, often there are some really ridiculous stereotypes that get propagated in media channels. And I think that social media is actually going to help fix this. One reason that we have this problem, I think, is that all the media industries around the world use very rigid segmentation techniques in order to understand their audience. They, they just didn't used to have much access to data about their audiences. They did not have a tool like the Bluefin tool. So what they did is they tried to understand audiences through their demographics, by their age, their race, how much money they make, where they live, and their gender. These were the basic sort of classifications for audiences, and that's how they're sold to advertisers. The problem is that certain assumptions get made about what people in particular demographic groups believe, what they think about the world, and what they think is important. And these assumptions are actually what underlie all of the popular cultural content that you hear on the radio, that you see on TV, that you see on the big screen. I call it the DNA of popular culture. If you really wanted to figure out, why am I watching Jersey Shore? <laughs> why are all these primetime dramas about murder and rape? <laughs> you can sort of tie it back to some really sometimes bizarre and interesting assumptions that marketers, advertisers, media companies have made over the years about specific demographic segments that they are trying to attract to their content. Because as Deb was explaining, most of that content is supported by advertisers. So if they can't deliver a, partic a particular demographic group to advertisers, they're not going to put the content on the air. Now at the Norman Lear Center, which is my research institute at the University of Southern California, We've done uh, quite a bit of research on demographics and advertising and popular culture, and we focused in particular on the 18 to 49 demographic. You're probably familiar with this, the 18 to 49 demographic. What does that mean? Think about the range of people in that demographic. But this is the main demographic that almost all ad sales are orchestrated around on mass media platforms, whether it's television or film or uh, radio stations, certainly. And it really grew out of the baby boomer generation in the 1960s. There used to be a huge population bubble between 18 to 49. But oddly enough, those, the baby boomers, have actually aged out of 18 to 49. So even though we've lost a huge uh, number of people out of this demographic group, you still see all of the mass media uh, companies still trying to understand their audience via this category. So when you look at the media landscape and you look at the population, you see that there is quite a, a distribution. And the odd thing is that Nielsen, the ratings company that is responsible basically for figuring out exactly how much a demographic is worth and how to measure audiences in the media landscape, they actually don't even conduct any research or provide any data about what people over 54 watch. The result of that is that that group really becomes invisible in our media landscape. If they can't be sold to advertisers, then they really don't count. And instead, what has turned out to be the case quite oddly in the last decade, I'd say, is that media companies have been prevailed upon by advertisers to find the hardest demographic to reach, which has turned out to be young males. 
So that's one reason that you see the kinds of films that you see at most of the multiplexes, is because they're looking for the 18 to 24-year-old male. Now, you've, maybe you've heard of psychographics. This is something that sort of was invented, I'd say, in the 1960s. This is Dr. Faye Miller, one of my favorite characters from Mad Men, the TV show. And what she did is she would create these complex psycho uh, psychological profiles of consumers, well beyond demographics, more about the psychology of the consumer. Well, this kind of research has been around for a long time, and, and inside brands and companies, they do a lot of work on this. But demographics is still the main way that consumers are understood in the advertising landscape. Now, at the Lear Center, we've been doing a lot of research on television, advertising, uh, the impact it has on content, and of course, we had to look at social media. You know, how is social media changing this entire ecology? Well, it's quite interesting, because what happens is that in social media networks, you have people connecting in all kinds of ways to one another, right? They don't have to go through some sort of mass media portal to do this. They connect directly to one another, have conversations, and create their own sort of audience communities. Now, all of these people belong to the same demographic categories uh, that they always did, but those categories mean even less now, in a way, than they did before. Because of these technological tools that we have, it's easier for us to kind of break out of our demographic boxes. Where you live doesn't mean as much anymore when you're communicating with people virtually online. How old you are is not immediately apparent. Sometimes your gender is completely invisible. Your race, all these things that used to categorize you as an audience member are sort of hard to ascertain online. You can try, but it can be a little difficult to figure out. And people are creating their own communities. They are figuring out what they like, and they're sharing information. And let me tell you, this is something that media companies want to understand. They know that the future of the mass audience will be a networked audience. There's, these are going to be people who are talking to one another about what they love and what they enjoy. They will be networked and connected. But I think the reason that media companies are having a terrible time online trying to monetize audiences, trying to sell their television content, for instance, online, is because they're still trying to understand these people through the lens of demographics. And why would they do that? Well, it's not because they're stupid. <laughs> it's because that's how ad sales are still determined. And until that changes, that's going to remain to be their focus, and they're going to continue delivering the kind of content that we see on TV now. I don't know if you've noticed the Wall Street Journal, has had a great investigative reporting series for the last uh, couple of years called What They Know. And it's all about the surveillance technologies that media companies, marketers, advertisers are using in order to figure out what people are doing online. And in one of their first research reports, they found that in the 50 most popular websites in the United States, an average of 64 tracking cookies were installed in people's browsers when they visited those sites. We're talking about Yahoo and Google, big sites. And of course, that makes all of us crazy. It makes us all concerned about the privacy issues. And this is going to become a bigger and bigger issue as this data becomes more and more valuable to more and more people. And we become more and more aware of how trackable we are. But the one sort of silver lining to this is that it means that our taste is actually being considered rather than assumed. Because it's all about taste. When people aggregate online, when they get together online, it's not usually around demographic categories. It's not because you're the same age as me, or the same gender, or the same nationality. It's because you have a similar interest to me. Interest communities are the communities, the audiences, that coalesce online. Now, when I meet a new person, it's more interesting to me to know that maybe they like parks and recreation, or they love Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, they like spy novels, they like the band Massive Attack, they like tongue-in-cheek horror films like Evil Dead 2. These are some of my favorite things. And I think this says so much more about me than my age, my gender, my race, and how much money I make. And if you wanted to sell me something, wouldn't you rather know that stuff rather than my age, 
and my gender. So as I did research on social media and television in particular, I found a lot of articles that said that women were the main users of a lot of social media platforms. Facebook is probably the one that most people know about. Then I heard it was even on Twitter that there are more uh, women who have Twitter accounts than men, even though men tend to tweet more. And I thought, well, I, what is this? It turns out that women are actually the dominant players on almost every single social media platform in every region around the world. So I thought, well, what, what does this mean? Comscore issued a very nice report, a global report, that said that in every single age group, in every region around the world, women actually outnumbered men on most social networking platforms. LinkedIn is the main exception. I think there's another one, too. And even more important to advertisers and marketers, women spend a lot more time on these sites. Now, there's a lot of academic research that could help explain why it is that women seem to be drawn to social media. But what surprised me is that it was really all around the world, in every region around the world, in places where it might be kind of hard for a woman to have a smartphone or an internet connection. It told me that there is a very deep drive among women. If they have access to social media platforms, they're probably going to use them a lot. And so it made me wonder, are we going to see a sea change in mass media? Is it going to be the case? Because media businesses and advertisers and marketers are so uh, hell-bent on understanding these online, socially networked audiences. Are they going to start catering to these audiences once they realize that they're female? Are we going to see a lot more shows with women in them? Are we going to hear a lot more female voices on the radio? Are blockbuster films actually going to be chick flicks? Is this what we have to look forward to? Well, I hope not. Oh my god, I'm a chick, but I hate a chick flick. And I just hate the idea that there's a certain kind of movie that will appeal to women. And I think there's a lot of people out there who feel like it's pretty insulting that filmmakers would think that there's a movie out there that appeals to African Americans, or to young people, or to young males who are white and uh, live in the South. These kinds of stereotypes that sort of emerge from the demographic categories that we've used to understand audiences lead to stereotypical uh, genres and to material that doesn't really suit our true interests. We're much more complicated people than this. And now that we're announcing what we like on social media platforms, there's a chance for media companies to actually hear what we're saying. And it does take complicated technology, like what they have at Bluefin, in order to figure this out. But this is becoming more and more available, and I think it's going to have a transformative effect on the media atmosphere. So, when you want to understand what's happening in the world, I think it's really important to figure out what people like, what they're interested in. And that's what these media companies know they need to do. Once they figure out what it is that people are motivated to do on their own time, their leisure time, whether they want to play chess, or they want to watch Criminal Minds, or they want to go shopping, these are ways in which we exercise and express who we are as people. And that's what marketers and advertisers and media companies want to understand. But guess who else wants to understand that? Politicians, governments, activists, academic researchers. We all want to understand this. This is an incredible window that we now have into our virtual world. Social media is offering a chance for us to understand humanity in a way that we've never understood it before. And I am happy to say and to hope that the media environment is going to become much more data-driven, much less stereotypical, and it's going to start reflecting what we really think about the world. And I think that'll be a beautiful thing. I'd like to thank my team who helped put together this great presentation. Thank you.
going to move on up here now. And let's keep you up here. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. My mic just decided to take a walk. And um, can you, can, is it, am I live now? Yeah. yeah, okay, good, all right. So what we're going to do now is to take a minute to um, have a bit of a conversation with both Deb and Johanna about what they see happening in the future based on the findings that they're working on today, the, the, the methodology that they're developing today, and so forth, and also engage with some of the questions that you folks have, have uh, contributed to us. So why don't you come and join me here, and we can put a little bit more light on so we can see the audience. That'd be great. There's real people out there. There they are. So um, let's just start a bit, and, and if you two could take it in whichever direction you want to, but um, where do you see this kind of research taking us in the future? You know, there's, there's ways in which one can look at it and say there are benefits, there are also some downsides that are potentially um, disturbing. Um, where do, you, where do you see us going in the future, based on what the work that you're doing today? Well, I think transparency is generally a good thing. And I think it's important to understand what it is that really fires people up. And so just on those two basic premises alone, I see the social media revolution as a wonderful thing for researchers and for anyone who's trying to better understand the global village. I think there's too little thought put into what it is that people enjoy in their lives. And that's why I think that entertainment research is something that is often sort of considered uh, less important than other kinds of research. It's something that we certainly face at the Norman Lear Center quite often. We study entertainment and media, and people often say, ah, oh, entertainment, it's so terrible. And, you know, the, the reality shows, what does that say about our world and about ourselves? And, and as I was saying in my talk, I think there's a big disconnect, actually, between the kinds of uh, popular entertainment that are being generated for us and the kind that we actually crave. And I think those two things are going to become more in alignment, and it will make our lives not just more enjoyable and filled with more pleasure, which is already a wonderful thing, but our desire will become more transparent. We'll be able to better understand what it is we value, what it is we really care about. And I think it'll give us a chance to reflect in a better way on what it is that makes us a, a human social animal, how it is that we actually uh, align with one another. And it was, it was something that I had tried to do in those two national surveys that she talked about earlier, about looking at the connection between entertainment preferences and political ideology. I think there are all kinds of connections there between the way we live our, our lived lives, our real lives, the serious choices we make in the voting booth, for instance, and what we do for fun. And it's very hard to understand those two things without a really, really robust data set, like the one that you have. I want access to your data. <laughs> we should talk. Yes. There's some serious data envy going on up here. Oh, my that. God. <laughs> I want the data so bad. Yes. <laughs> well, this is awkward. <laughs> I could do so much great research. So I, I probably should have told you before I accepted to, to speak today that I'm not very good at envisioning the future. So I, I don't really know how to answer your question um, beyond what sort of the, the things that I said in my, my remarks earlier. I, but I think that one of the reasons it's hard to see the future is um, the changes are so basic. Uh, it, it's sort of, and in terms of will the changes be good or bad, I think it's similar to, you know, imagine what it was like before humans knew how to speak and think how different things are once we invented language. Uh, a lot of good things came out of it, like how we 
create and transmit culture and most of everything we learn and pass along and all of the complex forms of human organization that we uh, depend on. And it's also how people scheme and plan and communicate and do bad things. Um, so it, it's sort of so fundamental. Uh, you know, is a telephone a good or a bad thing? Well, again, it, it, it changed completely uh, social networks and how we communicate. And uh, it's so powerful, it's unimaginable that it would only be used for good or only used for bad. So I, I think that social networks, we're already, of course, seeing this. It, it's already uh, sort of understood that it provides powerful new ways for organizations to form at time scales that used to take decades. Uh, to form a union used to take decades. Uh, to uh, create protests across every, you know, to start city in the U.S. and to spread, uh, you know, the Occupy kind of dynamics. Now the time scales have shrunk to the point where it's a, it's a completely different ball game. And, um, and it's early days. So I, it's hard to see where it will all go. But I, I think that uh, the ability to tune in and to hear many individuals, so to listen with granularity at scale, it, it's almost a, um, seems like an oxymoron, but it's now a reality. And that does transform, I think, the possibilities for media. And of course, media is sort of underwriting all sorts of basic forms of human organization. So it's, mm -hmm. and it's pretty fundamental. Well, I, I do think that there are a couple of things that, what, you've said a number of things, both of you have, that are important in terms of where we see the future going, but I have to say the things that immediately resonate with me are what you said about the whole issue of this isn't identifying people by demographics in the way we always did it. You know, that it's a, it's a question of people connecting based on interest versus the whole issue of, well, this is, this is you know, a gender thing and this is a, this is, African-American or this is this or whatever. Um, that is certainly a, a vision of the future that's quite remarkable and one that many of us, I think, would say we're, we're seeking. You know, um, when we talk about a world in which uh, diversity is not something that we have to constantly fight for, but it's something that becomes much more endemic to our culture, certainly what you're talking about is part of that process. Yeah, and I think there's money to be made there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not idealism that's <laughs> driving this. Yeah, yeah. It's, okay. There's a lot of money to be made in matching the content that's in media with what people actually want. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just going to be a phenomenal sort of shift. I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, we've already seen a big shift from when there were just three big major broadcast networks with a lot of, for the most part, cookie cutter shows to now a, a much broader and more variegated and rich sort of cable environment with many, many, many more options out there. But I think it's going to get much, much better. Mm -hmm. We have niche programming now, but you don't know niche. I mean, niche is going to get so niche. It's going to be the person who loves Indian food and criminal minds and, and, and likes to grow tobacco in their backyard. I mean, it's going to be really specific subgroups. And you're going to be able to find one another. I think it's going to be a, a very interesting sort of shift in our understanding of, uh, of human groups, communal ideas, and also what it is that our relationship to media can be. I think it'll be a, a much more motivated and data-rich kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, um, the, always just to look at flip side, it's interesting when we were, in a sense, bandwidth starved with television and there were only three networks, there was this sort of tiny sliver in, in sort of kind of long, long view of history where there was, really was a national conversation and where you would come in to work and at the water cooler, chances were the person you ran into saw what you saw. And because of the ever splintering sort of niche programming, um, you know, cable really ended the national conversation in many ways. And some see that as a loss. And that, that sort of artifact, technological artifact of limited bandwidth drove a kind of uh, connectedness that, that's gone. And in some ways, it's reappearing because now, even though you probably won't run to that person at the physical water cooler, there's digital water coolers abound where you can connect. And so that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But there are all these parallel conversations and so how do you actually have 
a nation that's connected or a world that's connected. So it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's complex. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's mm -hmm. a clear position. But well, well I, I'd also add that the, the second point is that the, uh, the TV genome image that you, that you showed us in terms of the data, mm -hmm. the data points on the Obama State of the Union, for example, that was, wasn't that really astonishing? really to just see that suddenly begin to evolve at the rate that it did. Now, I think if we really thought about it, we'd say, well, sure, there are these kinds of connections that are going on, but the connections, as you point out, back in the days when there were water coolers to talk about, um, there, was a, there was definitely a sense of you had a conversation with a certain set group of people that you saw on a daily basis where these are individuals from a multitude of circumstances, national, international, the landscape is massive, and it's an opportunity for people to exchange ideas in a whole other way. So while you may say, I'm not good at thinking about the future, I think <laughs> you're, you're making the future in a sense. You know, that's one thing that I see as, as pretty extraordinary. The, um the other thing that is astonishing about that kind of burst of conversation is there's a scale in terms of space that really is people across the entire country or actually you know, around the world that you can tune into. But the difference between the water cooler, which usually is, most people don't have water coolers at home, so it's at work, it's the day after, which means you've slept on it, you've encoded stuff in memory, it's stuck, and, and so it, it resonated deeply enough that it was worth bringing up at the water cooler. And then there's all the stuff that doesn't pass all those filters, but still registers. And you can only pick that up in a real time, in, in the flow context, because either you verbalize it as you feel it, or it's gone. Mm -hmm. And what we saw there is the latter. It's that stuff that's in the flow. So that kind of connectedness, which is the time scale is, is immense spatially, but it's incredibly tight temporally. It's happening in the moment. You, you can be connected to 100 million people instantaneously. That kind of a um, response function from, you know, sort of an audience has just never been available before. So yeah, that is, uh, I don't know that we're making the future. We're watching it. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting uh, views into it and we're right. kind of pulling right. it out. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure a number of you have noticed on uh, certain TV shows where now there is the uh, the whole thing that's happening where you're watching it and it says, if you want to have a conversation with this character, you know, connect in this way. And it's either through Twitter or, you know, or it's through going onto their website or, or whatever the particular path is that they ask you to follow. Um, my, my question is, how much does the research that you guys are doing feed into the development of that use by the various networks? Well, I think they've been desperately trying to figure out ways to convert interest that they see online in their media properties into deeper engagement in the brand and a better chance that those people will, will tune in in real time for their TV shows, right? The television industry has been terrified of uh, things like the TiVo, the digital video recorder, which allows people to watch TV at different times than when it's broadcast because there's a chance that they won't watch the ads, they'll fast forward through them, and it'll be harder for them to figure out and to convince the advertisers that they, that they ought to be advertising during their shows. So I think the television industry is really excited about the phenomena of social television, right? Because it's reinventing the living room experience, the real-time experience, because there's an incentive for people who are on social networks to watch the show exactly when it airs, because then they know they can tap into this really exciting real-time conversation with a bunch of other people around the world about the show they like. So they don't have to gather their friends and make some big effort to bring people to their living room or make sure that everybody in their family watches the show that they want to watch at their time. Instead, they'll be watching with people who have chosen to watch the show at the same time. And this, for the television industry, is a coup. They are thrilled that this is a possibility, and they think perhaps that they can get people back watching their TV shows in the sort of timeline that they have invented for their advertisers, basically. And the other side effect is that humans are brought back into synchrony with one another. We're, we're watching things at the same time again in a way that we thought we might never do again. 
with the DVR and with DVDs and with the chance of streaming shows online anytime we want. People were afraid this would become a more lonely experience and you'd be less connected. But it's very interesting to see that it, we weren't just going in one direction, away from in time watching everything with, with everyone else to new technologies that fragmented us into these niche audiences. Now it seems like we're being brought back together, but these groups are much tighter, much more motivated. They're, they're the ones who are really passionate about what they're viewing, and that's exactly what the television industry wants. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I remember as a kid being forced march to uh, go watch the Lawrence Welk show with the rest of my family. And um, I, I really regret that I didn't have the opportunity to tweet about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let, let's move into a couple of questions that folks have that I think are, are fairly serious ones, which is, what's, what is the profile of the people who tweet compared to the general population? What do we know about that? It skews uh, in various ways. It's, it's a younger, it's, it's certainly in no way representative of the U.S. population. Uh, it's young, uh, you know, people are going to be more technologically savvy, et cetera. Um, it probably looks quite similar to the Facebook um, demographic of three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can now also look at the change in the face, Facebook demographic, which still doesn't completely parallel the U.S. population, but is far more representative. There's still, um, you know, if you are interested in reaching uh, the, the very important 65 and over group, you're going to get uh, severe underrepresentation on both, more so on Twitter. Uh, so I think the, um, the skews are, are there. There are a lot of the most, you know, serious research uh, groups around the world that are now um, studying and quantifying and measuring those cues because there's, mm -hmm. there's sort of uh, well understood methods to do that. And what comes out of all of that is, is two things. One is if you know there's a skew and you can correct for it because you can unbias the data, you can say, well, I'm overcounting this group by a factor of two, so let me have all, the, all that I hear from them. And where there's just simply blind spots, like, well, this group is just not active, you have to know where your blind spots are and, and not uh, act on the data assuming that they're not interested or they're not there because actually they're just not engaged. And um, I think this is true of, uh, there, there's no exception to that rule. Every method of sort of understanding an audience or understanding a group has selection biases. Um, this one's no different. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's uh, in some cases pretty acute, but um, so that's, uh, I think the the way we look at it. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that in a, in a broadcast television era, it was extremely important that they have national representative samples because they were broadcasting to a nation. And so they needed to understand that vast vat of a group. And the best way, the cheapest way that they could do it was using demographic segmentation. That was, that was possible and plausible. But now, I think things are really going to shift. I think things are going to shift towards valuing self-selection. That what they want to do is they want to see people coalesce in very particular, granular ways. And they just want to understand that group. They want to be able to create content for that group. And so I think that's one way in which survey methodology is really going to change, or at least the goals of survey methodology may very well shift. Because this presumption that we need to understand a national representative sample is not necessarily the way that media content is going to be generated anymore. I think it's going to be much more niche, and there's going to be much more of an interest in, in diving in to the deep, deep data set and the deep, deep sort of ideology and values of very particular self-selected groups. Mm -hmm. And that kind of data is all over the place in social media. Trying to correct for all of that self-selection is a pain. Yeah, I think that one... This is look, getting really into kind of details of the sort of media business industry, but if anyone here who's interested, uh, one potential roadmap for the future of television is to just look at what happened in the internet, which is uh, decades ahead of television in terms of understanding audiences and uh, creating dynamic messaging and tuning to the individual and so forth. And, and a lot of the lessons learned in this new media world of digital is now being brought into uh, the old legacy world of television. Um, <clears throat> you know, thinking of it from more of an audience or sort of an entertainment 
point of view. I think there's uh, all sorts of new possibilities in terms of uh, storytelling. Imagine a story with two endings where depending on how people are talking about the first part of the story, the ending changes, right? Uh, not that difficult to imagine on a computer. You can, in various ways, control and, and sort of navigate content. But what about a television experience or a movie experience where you're just doing what you naturally do, which is talk about what you're watching, except you're a digital native, so your fingers do the talking. And now the, the sort of group response is actually steering the storyteller. So one of the most advanced, I think, forms of comedy is improv, where there are all sorts of content that you're drawing upon, but you're feeding off of the live audience to, to decide twists and turns you take in the performance. Imagine television or polished media experiences that have that live connection with the audience. I mean, that's sort of one of the key things that mass media and this broadcast mentality leads to uh, sound bites and one-way communication. So rather than a, a natural conversation where you talk with someone, you're being talked at. And uh, so sort of one just overall, I think, idea here is that mass media will become much more of a conversation again and sort of content. It's sort of, you know, it's that live connection with the audience. It's live mm -hmm. and uh, it can affect the communication on both sides. Yeah, well, even if you don't go into the, something that's as, uh, as, as apparently uh, um, mutable as improvisation, the same thing is true when you have live theater, where people mm -hmm. come to see a sure. show, and depending upon audiences, one of the things we always say in the theater is the Friday night audiences are the audiences who laugh the most. Why? Because it, when, I, this is always the case. When you're doing comedy, Friday night audiences laugh the most. Why? Because it's the end of the week and they are desperate to release. Saturday night audiences have a tendency to laugh, but they're not as vigorous about it because life is not quite as thrilling as they thought it might be. And they've also generally had a lot more to drink. Um, Sunday audiences are absolutely the worst. They're lethargic because why? They, we tend to eat heavier meals on Sundays. And we're also facing going back to the work week. So they're the audiences you dread. And you can really track behavior on the basis of what you know people's lifestyle is. And also, the actors behave differently based on that particular kind of feedback, even though it's the same show. You know, um, I'm reminded of uh, Marshall McLuhan, sort of well-known oh, media yes. theorist. One of the things that he wrote about you know, this is in the 60s, as television is, is, has clearly arrived and dominated culture. Uh, the difference between someone who would make it as a star in the movie industry was very different from the stars of television. Mm -hmm. And his analysis was, it was really a, a technological artifact, which was television was much lower resolution. There's no HDTV. And so because of the very grainy image of, of old TV, uh, the close-up was developed, so you would zoom into your face and every quiver and every blink and every smile would be transmitted. And those who had a very scripted and practiced style, you know, coming out of the world of theater that sort of had made mm -hmm. it in movies, failed on TV because they looked scripted and stilted. Yeah. And the much more intimate kind of personalities succeeded. And so one of the things I was just sitting here wondering about the future is, will there be a future where the you know, when the president gives the State of the Union, that live audience feedback lets him or her know how the nation is responding to things and demands that live person to react to the audience and say, oh, I just heard some people over there in the Northwest or in that social circuit kind of uh, wince at what I just suggested. L let me expand on that. And if yep. you don't, and you have that stilted practice, and it's totally just uh, a, um, a speech that was written for you, that, that the, uh, the country won't stand for that person as a leader. I mean, that could be a future where you demand a kind of intimacy and interactivity, which our politicians now, uh, whether, whatever they're what's under the hood, if they don't have that polished presence, they will fail. And that's, that's an artifact of mass media. Mm -hmm. um, so a two-way communication sort of shift could, could demand a different kind of um, person.
Uh, I think we all would have enjoyed seeing that what kind of uh, spike there was the time that Obama came out with the thing about uh, turning to guns and religion. Because um, oh, yeah. that certainly was a spike. <laughs> um, you know, one thing we'd like to ask you about here is um, some, this is, this is a question from one, someone in our audience, some would argue that the work companies like yours do, Deb, this is specifically related to yours, but certainly, Johanna, you have things you could add to this. Uh, the work companies like yours do is most pertinent to media companies, marketers, etc. What sorts of applications of this technology and data are there to other areas such as medicine, science, etc.? Well, actually, um, it's, it's funny. We were, I was just hearing about some work that, that your center is doing in, in um, uh, so I should, I'm going to shut up really quickly rather than <laughs> summarize what you just told me, but uh, how mass media actually influences people's beliefs on mm -hmm. things like health and how understanding the influences of mass media on beliefs out there, understanding that mapping is a first step to then correcting and changing what's, what's actually driving a lot of behavior. I mean, one of the biggest um, uh, causal uh, factors in, in health outcomes is behavior. Yeah. Right? And, and uh, so, I mean, there's a huge media intersection with just about anything that matters. Uh, I think it's it's fair to make that sweeping a statement. But. Well, that's that's why I that? want access to sure. this data set. <laughs> yeah, our our biggest project right now at the Norman Lear Center is called Hollywood Health and Society. And what we do actually is is we get grants from federal agencies like the Centers for Disease Control to try to help to get accurate health information into fictional TV shows. So primetime dramas, daytime soap operas, just think about how many health storylines you've seen in those shows. Well, there's a good chance they, t they talk to us. And what we do is we just easily sort of hook them up with the number one expert in bioterrorism, or the person who is the expert on type A diabetes. Because they realize that in a socially networked social media environment, it's even more important than it ever was before for them to get this stuff right. Because people will go online and complain. And the great side effect of putting accurate information into even fictional TV content is that people actually learn a lot. They get engaged in the stories. If they've been watching the same soap opera for 10 years, let me tell you, they're going to pay attention to the storyline about how Jake got HIV and how he may have passed it on to his girlfriend. And when we put a, t when we put a telephone number on there, a 1-800 number saying, do you want to find out more? There's a huge spike in the number of people who will call in order to find out more about HIV because they become engaged in a storyline that's gotten them to think about a health issue that they may not have thought about before. It's not something you necessarily like to think about, but you embed it in an entertainment product and it becomes an opportunity for a discussion, for them to talk to people in their family about it. And so we do research in order to figure out exactly what the impact is after we know that these stories have run. And it's really quite phenomenal, the kind of impact that it can have. And we give awards each year as well to TV shows that do a really great job uh, putting accurate health information into TV shows and preventative messages in particular. That's something that the public health community is very passionate about, is that if TV shows could actually tell people how they could avoid these terrible diseases and, and violence and all kinds of problems, then we'll have a healthier country. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another question from people in the audience. With all these advances in virtual online worlds and communities, from Facebook to video games and alternative realities, do you think part or all of our society will ever become like those in movies such as The Matrix and Surrogate, where people actually live their lives in a virtual world? Well, I think that what you were talking about a moment ago, that example of a politician who would need to respond in real time to people's uh, a reaction to what they're saying over mass media channels, I see that feedback loop getting smaller and smaller and smaller and tighter and tighter and tighter to the point that our, our media atmosphere is, is so clearly overlapped with our real lives that it might be hard for us to tell them apart. And I think that's exactly what a virtual world is. So imagine a movie, for instance, that you go to where you don't expect to sit in a seat and just watch a screen. 
Instead, you feel like you're part of the action. You feel like you're running with the dinosaurs and you can touch them. It's sort of the film meets the theme park, meets the game, meets the virtual space. This is the truly immersive entertainment experience. And I would venture to say it's going to be the measure of success of our political experiences, our sexual experiences. This is the trajectory that we're on, finding a way to make media more deeply embedded in our real lives, to enhance it, to make it more real, to give us more access. This is the direction I think we're going. And it's one reason that I was so excited by the lineup of speakers for this series. I've read Ray Kurt's file. I'm very interested in Werner Vinge. Is that how you pronounce his name? I never knew Werner how. Werner Vinge, yep. Yeah, I'm reading Rainbow's End now. So I've been very interested in exactly this, the moment when the screen is no longer something that we feel distanced from. It's something that, that we seem to be embedded within. And it's going to raise a lot of really crazy ethical issues and moral issues, and I think it's going to be very confusing. But I think it's a very exciting sort of uh, transformation. Yeah, I don't know if I have much to add. I mean, it's not a virtual reality versus physical reality. We are all living a dual reality. Uh, and sometimes we get lost in one or the other part of that duality. Um, but a lot of the build out of virtual, you know, the virtual reality images of the 1990s, the cheesy 3D graphics put on the helmet and get teleported to a, uh, a, another um, space is being replaced by far more you know, powerful technologies that you carry in your pocket, that you wear on your clothes, that are part of your car, just integrated into your everyday environment. And I don't think people are moving around less. In fact, for reasons of energy and, and traffic and environment, it would probably be good if we did move around less. And, uh, there's no obvious sign of that any more than we've got a paperless office now that we have more screens. So it's, again, one of these hard to predict dynamics, but I, I agree, it's a, a dual reality and things are getting more and more woven together. Whether it's location-based this or real-time that, this is um, the fundamentals of time and space. They're kind of hard to escape. Um, is a pure virtual, you know, uh, uh, reality or existence a bad thing. I'm just thinking about now uh, someone I met who had cerebral palsy and if you met this person sort of physically you would think there's somebody, nobody home and with this you know sort of little tapper on attached to his forehead he could tap out messages and navigate the internet and I started exchanging emails with him and in a virtual world who would know and and so he sort of has this very rich life but physically completely trapped. Um, mm -hmm. So it's uh, many different, I think, sort of ways to imagine what all this will mean. But and of course, if you take it back to the point Johanna was making earlier about um, the, the sort of um, world in which you don't necessarily know with whom you are connecting, you could connect with that person and have no oh, knowledge yeah. whatsoever about their physical condition. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know. And I, Which I, provides a kind of freedom to that individual. Oh, yeah. And I've heard it's very much the case within Second Life. I haven't done any uh, research myself on this. Second Life is a, an immersive virtual world where you have an avatar that moves mm -hmm. through a three-dimensional reality. It all unfolds in real time. At any one moment, there's like 35,000 people in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people who are severely disabled or agoraphobic or have all kinds of problems that don't allow them to socialize or go outside, Second Life is such a relief for them. It's a place where they can have a different kind of body and a different kind of movement, and they can be perceived in a completely different way. So um, I think there's all kinds of therapeutic opportunities for virtual mm -hmm. worlds like this. I know the U.S. military is using Second Life for people who are coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder. They can recreate the scene of the crime, the moment that really shattered somebody, recreate it and allow them to sort of take mastery over it, to keep going through it. They heard the dog bark, they saw the shell go off, their friend was hurt. They can get through it. So it's, it's so interesting that these virtual technologies can be used to help people in very material, physical ways. You know, I think we tend to think of virtual worlds as ah, something else, something other, something separate. 
But I think we're going to see them getting closer and closer and closer to our own world. And, and sometimes I think this is going to have great benefits. Okay. Um, we have a question here from a gentleman in the audience, which is, is there a chance that things which appeal only to smaller groups, such as foreign news, for example, will disappear altogether? I think it's actually the opposite. I think the market is going to become more amenable to niche groups, that uh, there will be more opportunities and more methods for content providers like those who supply foreign news to find the audience they need in order to get the advertising money to fund the creation of that content. Um, there was somebody in the class that I was talking to today in the Honors Colloquium who said, his specialty is modern classical music. This is something that is pretty obscure to most people. There probably aren't many modern classic music experts in this audience. Is it you? I said, yes. And he's like, Twitter has been amazing because these people who have this very specific niche interest, who use a specific hashtag, can get together a network and share the information that they love and make it possible for a potential business model to actually emerge. An online radio station, for instance, that's just devoted to modern classical music. And so I think that's one reason that I'm so excited about the possibilities, is that I think the, the media opportunities there will be there for people who have niche interests in a way that wasn't the case before. Yeah, I think that, uh, once again, there's, there's always two sides to it. On one, one hand, I think that the data speaks for itself. With increased bandwidth, there's just an ever-increasing diversity of media and uh, sort of content for every taste, so more and more niche. On the other hand, um, the uh, number of languages spoken worldwide is, is on the downward, and so there's certain kinds of diversity that are being killed mm -hmm. uh, and other sorts of diversity that are flourishing. Um, so I think it depends on which species you're studying. <laughs> We're going to see uh, you know, uh, multiplication of some and decimation of others mm -hmm. you know, in, in the world of culture and media. Okay, as the, the last thing, because we've actually covered a lot of the different questions in, in a variety of ways, um, the last thing I'm going to ask you both to speak to, and your answer can't be, I want his data set, okay? I want his data set. <laughs> Did I mention um, that? Yes. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you, and I think our audience probably would too, what are the things that you dream about doing that are not in, within your grasp right now, but you see on the horizon? Oh, see on the horizon? It's a, it's a distant horizon. But one thing we've been really interested in doing at the Norman Lear Center for many years now is trying to gauge or measure the attention economy. We're very interested in trying to find some way to figure out what is dominating attention in some particular market, in some particular uh, geographic location. Uh, it could be nation by nation. And we've tried different ways to try to figure out what those metrics might look like. Because as I was mentioned in the honors colloquium today, if you're talking about entertainment, really you're talking about attention and the allocation of attention. And it's my belief that attention is really the most valuable thing in the world. Human attention is invaluable. Without it, nothing else really matters. It doesn't really exist without human attention being turned to it. And so trying to figure out what the economy of attention is is, is just a great nut I'd love to, tr to crack. And it would require some immense and amazing, fabulous tool like the one they've developed at, at Bluefin, but it would have to be far more than just television. That was one of my questions earlier of you. I was like, oh, so are you doing more than just TV? <laughs> well, like I said, I'm, I'm horrible at this, envisioning the future. So I, I tripped you, over you one. You always say that, yeah. and then you come out with something that is very visionary and very future. Well, I, I, I tripped over one kind of by accident, this idea of a president having a live conversation and yes. the audience demanding it. So I'm just going to stick with that, which is imagine one person having a meaningful conversation with a billion. Um, why not? I, I think it's, we can't do it today, but I think that would be a, a, a pretty fantastic new reality. I think it's, in, it's on the horizon. 
Well, very interestingly, I think uh, there are philosophers who might look at that or theologists who might look at that particular issue and say there are people who are doing that now in a faith-based and some might call it a virtual reality. You know, I mean, it's an interesting notion, the whole idea of an enormous number of people having a conversation with one person. It's over my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of, I mean, there are, there are millions of people around the world who believe they are having conversations with God, or whoever their God is. So I guess, since we started off talking about data, and empirical <laughs> methods, I'd say I see on the horizon making that demonstrably and, and measurably and empirically the case. That's, that's sort of the, the horizon I see. And this is a man who says he's not good at thinking about the future. So <laughs> um, I, I, I want to say that this has been absolutely fascinating, um, and I, I really, really appreciate having both of you here. Before we thank our guests this evening, I do want to remind you all of a change in our schedule, and that is that next week, next week November 15th, Lori Zoloth, who is talking about ethics and genetics, is going to be here. And Richard Clark will be joining us on the 29th of November. There won't be a speaker the week of Thanksgiving. Okay, so you all have time to prepare your feasts. Um, and given the way the turkey population is going in Rhode Island, you can actually go hunt the sucker. Um, so, and on December 6th, I want to remind you of what promises to be an eye-opening evening, and that is when our URI Honors class presents their very own sense of the future as we are the future. So please join me in thanking Johanna Blakely and Deb Roy. Thank you. Thank you.